So many thanks everyone for joining us today to discuss whether 2021 marks a new era for private wealth immigration. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Susanna Harvey, one of the partners in the private wealth team here at Burgess Salmon, with a particular focus on advising clients considering moving to the UK and all of the issues they should consider, including their UK tax position and their UK immigration status. I'm joined by one of my colleagues in our private client team, Myra Lung, who like me advises on immigration and tax matters, and by one of my colleagues in our employment team, Katie Hayes, who specialises in advising on all types of business immigration routes and on the related employment law issues. So if we could move to the next slide. So we'll start today's webinar by discussing the new immigration system introduced from 1 January 2021 and some of the announcements over recent months on changes we may see to the immigration system over the coming years. We will then outline the key requirements of the existing available visa routes before discussing how clients can obtain permanent residence, which is also known as indefinite leave to remain, and if desired, how clients can obtain British citizenship. Finally, we will flag some of the other issues to consider when moving to the UK before taking any questions at the end. If we don't have time to answer all of the questions today, or if you think of a question after the webinar is concluded, then please do get in touch with any of us after the webinar. Our contact details are at the end of the slides and the slides will be circulated later today. So we could move to the next slide. So Brexit and the new system. Well, up until the end of December 2020, there were effectively two immigration systems, one for EEA nationals and their families and one for non-EEA nationals. The system for EEA nationals was governed by the EEA regulations and allowed such nationals and their families to live and work in the UK free of, free of immigration restrictions. However, as a result of Brexit, that system has now come to an end. There was a transitional period until the end of December 2020, so any EEA nationals who moved to the UK before this date and applied under the EU settlement scheme before the end of June 2021 should have been granted either pre-settled or settled status. But the deadline for applying under the EU settlement scheme has now passed. And whilst we understand the Home Office will still consider late applications in some circumstances, any EEA national considering moving to the UK now who hasn't already secured pre-settled or settled status will be in the same position as non-EEA nationals. Therefore, from 1 January 2021, the rights of EEA and non-EEA nationals considering moving to the UK have been aligned. Um, so the position for anyone considering move to the, moving to the UK now is governed by the UK law and by the immigration rules. A new points-based system has been introduced with effect from the 1st of January 2021. To a large extent, the new points-based system is an updated version of the pre-existing work visa route um, and Katie will provide more information on this shortly. But what will the immigration system look like in the future? Well, in the spring budget 2021, the government announced a number of immigration policy decisions with the aim of modernising the UK's immigration system to help the UK attract and retain the most highly skilled globally mobile talent, particularly in areas such as academia, science, research and technology. One of the announcements is a new elite points-based system, which they say will be introduced by, introduced by March 2022. And within this visa category, there will be a scale-up stream that will enable those with a job offer from a recognised UK scale-up to qualify for a fast-track visa. As part of this new visa category, there are also indications that the government intends to introduce an unsponsored work visa route as was recommended by the Migration Advisory Committee in a report back in January of this year. In August 2020, the government stated that it would create a broader unsponsored route within the points-based system to run, run alongside the employer-led system that Katie is going to explain shortly. The indications were that this would allow a smaller capped number of the most highly skilled workers to come to the UK without a job offer and without being tied to any specific employer. And this route may be of interest, you know, when we see the details, obviously, to a number of our high net worth clients, as one of the disadvantages for current work-based visas is that individuals' immigration status is then tied to their specific employment. There's a lot of talk at the moment about new routes focused on science and on tech, 
but it seems most likely that this will be catered for by adjusting existing categories, whether that's the new points-based system or other existing routes such as the startup, innovator or global talent routes. And as well as an increased focus, at least in terms of policy announcements towards tech-based jobs, the immigration itself, system itself is moving towards um, digital status. So just as we've seen a push towards a paper free tax system with the drive for all tax returns to be filed online, the Home Office is moving towards digital status and immigration applications too. So this started in earnest with the EU settlement scheme and is an option for the Hong Kong BNO visa that Myra is going to discuss as well. So whilst in the long term it seems clear that we will move to a fully digital system, in the short term this is likely to create issues as the system struggles to cope with that shift. We could move on to the next slide. Thank you. So moving on to the existing visa categories out there, is the tier one investor visa still the most attractive option for our high net worth clients? Well, it's a difficult question, but in short, the answer is often yes. Its appeal is its relative simplicity and its flexibility. So if you're happy to make the required investment, which is of at least two million pounds in qualifying investment, you should be granted an initial visa for three years and four months. At the end of that period, the visa is extendable for two years at a time, provided you can show that the investment has been maintained throughout. You can work if you wish, but you don't have to, and you're not tied to any particular employer or to any particular type of employment. You can bring your family with you, albeit it's only your spouse, your unmarried partner and your minor children. With the Hong Kong BNO visa that Myra will discuss, you can actually bring a wider class of dependents, so it is still relatively limited with the investor visa. There's no English language requirement, unlike with many of the other categories. And at the end of the relevant period, you can apply for permanent residence or indefinite leave to remain in the UK, at which point in very broad terms, you're free of immigration restrictions and you can dispose of the investment at that stage if desired. The relevant period to qualify for permanent residence with the investor visa does depend on the level of the investment you make. So you can apply for permanent residence after five years if you invest two million, after three years, if you invest five million, and after two years, if you invest 10 million. So, but what are the issues with the investor visa? Well, I suppose whilst the investor visa is still very popular, and for some high net worth clients, it can be the only appropriate option, particularly if they don't intend to work in the UK or they want the flexibility regarding who they work for or what they do. There's been growing concern over the past few years as to whether the category will, will be withdrawn or changed in light of the wider political climate and concerns raised by bodies like the OECD about investment based visas. The OECD has been focused in particular on countries that offer a cash for citizenship type option, which requires very little connection to the country involved and in some cases very limited amounts of time to be spent in the country before citizenship will be granted provided a sufficient investment is made. And that is not the case with the investor visa. So whilst there is no specific time periods that you need to spend in the UK to renew an investor visa, you do need to show that you've spent in very broad terms, at least half of each year in the UK in order to apply for permanent residence. And you need to be able to show that you've spent even greater periods in the UK over a full five year period prior to applying for citizenship. And therefore, the investor visa is not a quick route solely to a British passport without spending time in the country. Further, in many of the other cases criticised by the OECD, the cash is paid for the visa or the citizenship. The funds are not simply invested for a period of time, as is the case with the investor visa. However, regardless of this, it seems very likely that any visa based on investment will continue to be scrutinised carefully over the coming years. The criteria have already been tightened. So, for example, it is now necessary to show that you've held the funds for at least two years prior to making the application. Or if you, if you haven't held them, you need to evidence the source of the funds. Whereas it used to be that you only needed to show a three month period. Um, likewise, the investments that qualify um, are now, have now been significantly tightened and narrowed. And over time, it seems likely that other changes will be made to the category. So, for example, the level of the investment required may also increase. Could move on to the next slide. Thank you. So pre-arrival. Well, 
in order to make the application for an investor visa, you need to be able to show that you've you have the required funds at your disposal and that you've held the funds for at least two years. You must also have opened a bank account with a UK regulated bank that can receive the funds. You don't need to transfer the funds prior to making the application, but you must already have a UK bank account and the funds must be invested in qualifying investments within three months of your arrival in the UK. And as it can now take you know, significant periods of time to open accounts and to set up these things, it really is important to consider this at the earliest opportunity. At this stage, we also always flag the UK tax considerations because it really is important to consider your immigration and your tax planning together. Our tax year runs from the 6th of April to the 5th, 5th of April, so that's very unusual for, for many individuals moving to the UK and not something they'd necessarily imagine would be the case. And the starting position is that you're either UK tax resident for the whole tax year or you're not resident for the whole year. Therefore, by way of example, if you move to the UK in, say, August, it is possible that you'll be treated as UK tax resident from the previous 6th of April. In some circumstances, split year treatment may be available for tax purposes, but it is only applies in quite limited circumstances and it doesn't apply for all tax purposes. Therefore, we have seen clients who have come to us for tax advice after moving to the UK and, and having already applied for and obtained their investor visa. Um, but if it's in the same tax year, for example, that, that they've come to see us um, and that they've moved to the UK and they've made that required investment in the UK already, there have been cases where we've discovered that they've potentially triggered a very significant UK tax charge by the way that they generated the funds required to make the um, investment and then remitted those funds to the UK. There is normally a way to plan for these scenarios, particularly as residents for immigration purposes and residents for tax purposes are not the same. Um, but it is important to consider tax at the same time as immigration, particularly with something like the investor visa, which requires a significant investment to be made into the UK and therefore does have the potential to, to trigger a significant UK tax liability if it's not dealt with properly. At this stage, I'm going to hand over to Myra to talk through some of the other possible existing visa categories. Thank you, Susanna. Andrew, can we have the next slide, please? So there are different types of family visa and the most common ones we see tend to be the fiancé visa and the spouse visa, which applies to married couples, civil partners and unmarried partners who have lived together for at least two years. We have set out the four key requirements on the slide for you. Starting with the relationship requirements, apart from stating the obvious, there are further points to note. So for example, for partner and fiancé visas, you have to prove that the applicant and the sponsor are in a genuine and subsisting relationship. What it really means is that the Home Office must be satisfied that the relationship is not a sham. The applicant and the sponsor also have to show the intention to live together permanently in the UK. Whereas for parents, children and adult dependent relatives, the emphasis of the visa is placed on care responsibility and dependency. We have then set out the basic financial requirements on the slide for you um, and we'll go into them in a bit more detail later. It's often easy to miss the accommodation and maintenance requirements. Essentially, the applicant has to show that they've got access to a property in the UK, whether it's owned or rented, which meets the room standard and the space standard under the Housing Act. The policy intention behind this is to prevent overcrowding. So for example, a family of six living in a one bedroom flat is not going to meet the requirements. Whilst it might not be an issue for high net worth clients, they might wish to refer to a house they own, for example, in Surrey, rather than a small London flat in the application form. Although the client might be fluent in English, they, might, they still have to meet the English language requirement by taking a test unless they are exempt. For example, if they're national from um, a specified English speaking country such as Australia, or they hold a degree taught in English. Next slide, please. So we're now going to spend a bit more time to discuss the key considerations for high net worth and ultra high net worth clients. For those who are aware of the concept of domicile, the requirement of a couple having the intention to live permanently together in the UK by raising an alarm bell. As Susanna has already mentioned, whilst the UK has two distinct systems of tax and immigration, the two often interact. We advise on this requirement on a case-by-case -case basis because it's very fact-specific, but do let us know afterwards if you have further questions on this point. 
So if the applicant is married to a British spouse, then they should apply for a spouse visa because it takes precedent over um, a parent visa. However, if a couple are thinking about separation or divorce, then they need to consider switching from the spouse visa to a parent visa if they have a British child or children together. It's often a very delicate issue and we work closely with our family law specialists on this transition to make sure that the clients receive joined up immigration and family law advice. So in terms of the financial requirements, it's quite easy to overlook them because the client is a high net worth or ultra high net worth individual. Depending on whether they wish to use income and or cash savings to demonstrate that they meet the requirement, they must provide the relevant evidence, so for example, pay slips and bank statements for a specified period. Let's say if the applicant wants to use cash savings, then they need to show that they've got the minimum required funds for at least six months prior to the date of application. It goes without saying that having the right evidence is key to a successful immigration application, but this is particularly important for family visa application because this category is subject to the most abuse and therefore the Home Office tend to look at the supporting documents very closely. The latest Home Office guidance published at the end of June emphasises on the quality over the quantity of the evidence provided by the applicant. Can we have the next slide please? So apart from helping high net worth individuals, we often advise their children in terms of the available immigration route after they finish their studies in the UK. The most relevant routes are the graduate visa, the skilled worker visa, and the tier one investor visa. You might remember that the tier one post-study work visa route was withdrawn in 2012. However, it's welcome news that it's been reincarnated as the graduate visa route with effect from the 1st of July this year. Essentially, it gives the applicant two years to stay in the UK and they can work, look for work, uh, become self-employed or volunteer during this time. Alternatively, if the applicant um, secures a job when they graduate, then they might be eligible for a skilled worker visa, which Katie's going to talk about later. So we have advised recent graduates on applying for the Tier 1 Investor Visa um, because they did not qualify for any other categories at the time. They were able to make the minimum £2 million investment, but not every client wants to give £2 million to the 21-year-old who's graduated recently. So it's also worth mentioning that um, students are not exempt from UK tax, so they might require tax advice as part of the Tier 1 Investor application, as Susanna has highlighted already. We want to mention that the time spent on the student visa in and of itself does not qualify for permanent residence but it can be included under the 10-year long residence indefinitely to remain route. It can be complicated when advising students and recent graduates. So for example, um, we advise a Chinese family on issues concerning a young couple living together in London. The client's son held a tier one investor visa and the son's girlfriend wanted to become his unmarried partner for immigration purposes so that she could stay in the UK after her studies. The client was a bit concerned that there could be asset protection issues and it was not appropriate to suggest any sort of cohabitation or nuptial agreement to the young couple. It goes back to the point that immigration advice should be considered in conjunction with tax and family advice. Next slide please. So the UK ancestry visa well, it's only really relevant to Commonwealth citizens, so we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on this category today. And we've set out the key criteria for you on the slide. One of the criteria is that the applicant must have a UK-born grandparent. Well, in that case, it's also worth exploring whether they're actually entitled to British citizenship before making the application. And we'll talk about citizenship uh, in a bit more detail later. So the applicant only needs to show that they have the ability and intention to work in the UK, which includes voluntary work. So they don't have to have a job offer from a UK employer and they can work for more than one employer whilst they're in the UK. Visa is granted for five years and is extendable. And the visa holder will be eligible to apply for indefinitely to remain after living in the UK for five years under the UK ancestry visa. The application fee is quite low, which is around £500 per applicant, and the applicant 
family needs to show that they can support themselves and their family members whilst they're in the UK to meet their maintenance requirements. We have seen an increased number of inquiries from South Africa lately due to the recent events, so please do get in touch if you will require, or require further assistance. Moving on, can we have the next slide, please? So the Hong Kong BNO visa. As a Hong Kong national, I've received quite a number of inquiries, professionally and personally, um, on the Hong Kong BNO visa. Again, this is only relevant to Hong Kong BNO passport holders and family members, so we're not going to talk about it in detail today. Um, with my tax lawyer hat on, I was surprised to see the requirement on the government website that the applicant must have a permanent home in the UK. Well, this is not quite true, because if you look at the actual immigration rules, the legal requirement is that the applicant must be ordinarily resident in Hong Kong, the UK, Guernsey, Jersey or the Isle of Man on the date of application, so it's a bit more flexible than what it says on the website. Also, for this route, the financial requirement threshold is not as high compared to other UK immigration routes, for example, um, the T1 Investor visa. Um, but the formula to calculate this is quite complicated. Um, essentially, the applicant have to show that after paying for the necessary housing costs, they have at least the equivalent amount left for someone who's receiving benefit in the UK. Also, it's worth mentioning that um, previously, the leave outside the rules provision enable applicants to come to the UK first before making the application. However, this grace period ended a few days ago, which means that the applicants who are living in Hong Kong now will have to make the application in Hong Kong first before coming to the UK. And as Susanna has mentioned, the Hong Kong BNO route has the most generous provisions for including family members as dependents as part of the application. For example, grandparents and even uncles and aunts, etc. I lived with my grandparents growing up and it's common for three generations to live together in Hong Kong. So it's quite nice to see that the Home Office has taken this into account when they created this route. Again, um, although we cannot advise on Hong Kong tax, we understand that the income tax rates in Hong Kong are much lower than the income tax rates in the UK. Also, we understand that there are no capital gains tax or inheritance tax in Hong Kong, so we strongly recommend that clients seek Hong Kong and UK tax advice before they move to the UK, as we would with any other country. Um, Katie is now going to talk about the work-related visa options in the UK. Thanks, Myra, and thanks, Andrew, for the next slide. So I'm going to briefly run through the three main business immigration routes to the UK as set out on the slide. So the skilled worker visa, the intercompany transfer visa, and the representative of overseas business visa. So we refer to these as business immigration routes as the main thing with these particular routes is that you need to be sponsored or supported by a particular organisation, as mentioned by Susanna earlier. So it's not an appropriate route if, for example, you're hoping to come to the UK and work on a self-employed basis or without the backing of a particular business. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. So turning first to the skilled worker route, uh, in order to enter the UK under this route, there are various requirements, which I've summarised on the slide. Uh, turning to these very briefly, you first must have been offered a job by a company in the UK with a sponsor licence. So a sponsor licence will essentially enable that organisation to sponsor the individual for the purpose of them then applying for their visa. Uh, it's not a problem, though, if the organisation does not yet have a licence, as they may apply for one for the purpose of sponsoring sponsoring you or your, or your client. The second requirement is um, there is a minimum skill level for the role. So RQF3 is essentially the qualifications you would receive upon leaving school. So in the UK, that would be A-levels and it would be equivalent um, elsewhere as well. Um, it's the skill level of the job that's important, not your formal qualifications. So um, typically, actually, RQF3 is, is quite easy to satisfy, provided um, it's above, you know, above leaving school age sort of level of uh, skill. The third is the minimum salary requirements as set out on the slide. Um, so it's fairly low, although there are subject to certain exceptions as well. The one I wanted to talk about in a bit more detail is the English language requirement, which we have mentioned a few times throughout the presentation. Um, and in particular with skilled worker, it can be the area that we find 
um, some trip up on as even if your English is fluent and you can demonstrate that you've worked in English speaking countries such as the, the US or Australia or you've worked in an international organization that's not enough you need to be able to demonstrate your knowledge of English in a prescribed way as set out in the immigration rules so the three main routes for doing so would be being a national of an English speaking country as you would expect um, studying in English at degree level um, or passing a secure English language test um, which there are a specific set of centres that provide the particular test that you, that you would require. There are some limited other ways of satisfying the English language requirements. So certain job roles have particular exceptions. Um, there's exemptions for those over or under a certain age. But we do find that English language can sometimes be a sticking point for, for high net worth clients. It wouldn't prevent you from applying for skilled worker. It just may mean the process will take a little bit longer while you get the evidence you need to make that application. If applying from outside the UK, you also have um, a minimum maintenance requirements as set out on the slide. But if you've been in the UK for at least 12 months, um, there's no need to, to demonstrate that maintenance. And typically employers will certify maintenance um, on the individual's behalf and you know that tends to be our recommendation as it makes the application process for the visa far more straightforward. It's worth noting that um, it's not set out on the slide but previously under the old immigration system employers had to meet something called the resident labour market test which essentially means that they had to advertise the vacancy for a minimum period of 28 days in certain prescribed media it was only after completing that test that if they hadn't identified any settled workers, um, you know, any UK nationals, for example, or previously EEA nationals, that they could then sponsor um, a foreign worker, which essentially meant that if a UK applicant or previously EEA applicant under the old system met the minimum criteria for that vacancy, then they would have to offer the job to them rather than the foreign national, even if the foreign national was better suited for the role. So it's really good news that under the new system, that whole resident labour market test has been removed. So it should mean that actually it's more straightforward for a foreign migrant to be able to secure work in the UK, although there always still needs to be that genuine vacancy to prevent any kind of um, you know, false application or fraud in order to try and come into the UK. So under skilled worker, you can be sponsored for up to five years, although there's the option to extend as well. And the good news about this route is it can lead to settlement as well. So if you're thinking about coming to the UK on a more permanent long term basis, the skilled worker route can be quite a good option. Uh, I'll now talk about the um, intercompany transfer route. Andrew, if we could go to the next slide, please. So this route is one to be aware of if you or your client um, works for an international organisation that has a linked entity in the UK. So the route itself is divided into um, what is confusingly called the intercompany transfer route and then the intercompany graduate trainee route. Um, I focus on the intercompany transfer route on this slide as you know the graduate trainee route is only useful in certain limited circumstances and typically not for high net worth individuals. Um, the key requirements again are set out on, on the slide. So there's typically a 12 month minimum service requirement. So you've worked for that um, overseas entity for at least 12 months, unless you're classified as a high earner. So that's if you earn £73,900 or more. There's a skill level as well. So this one's RQF6, which means it's degree level or equivalent for the role. So slightly higher than skilled worker. And there's a minimum salary as well. But this time, again, a little bit higher than skilled worker as set out on the slide. There's the maintenance test, which is exactly the same as skilled worker too. But the, one of the key distinctions between the two routes is that there's no English language requirement for ICT. So that can be really, really helpful um, if English language is going to prove difficult to, to demonstrate. So this route is similar in terms of timeframes and that you can be sponsored for up to five years in any six year period. Or if you're a high earner, nine years in any 10 year period. Although with this route, it does not lead to settlement. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. So I'm not I'm not going to go into detail about how you go about applying for these visas, but essentially all you would do is this the organization sponsoring you would provide you with a certificate of sponsorship or a cause. You then use that cause to make your visa application. 
pay the relevant fees that you need to pay, you provide your biometrics, and then you essentially will wait for the outcome of your application. So typically you're looking at um, about generally three weeks if you're applying from outside the UK from the point you provide your biometrics at the UK Visa Application Centre, or if within the UK, actually up to eight weeks. So it takes a little bit longer, although um, there are priority services available to expedite um, those applications subject to a fee. Um, a quick note on timing, actually, because it's something that people do forget. Sometimes a sponsor will have a certificate of sponsorship or a cause available immediately, um, and therefore they can assign it to you very, very quickly, and you can pull together your application in, in very quick time as well. But if the sponsor does not have one of those COS available, they will need to apply for one. And now that can take as little as one working day, or it can take up to 18 weeks. Um, depending on the type of certificates that's required and depending on whether the sponsor is prepared to pay a fee to expedite the application. So that's just something to bear in mind with, with ones like Skilled Worker and ICT is it's not just your own application you need to bear in mind. There's that relationship with the employer and they need to be on the ball in order for you to progress your application quickly. And you also would need to think about, as with any visa application, aside from your own, if you're hoping to bring family members with you, children or, or partners, for example, you need to factor in their visa applications at the same time. Um, and, that, and that can mean things do take a little bit longer. And next slide, Andrew, please. So we've touched on these already, but I just thought it'd be helpful to summarise the main pros and cons of the two routes um, in on one slide for you. So this will be in that the handout. But for our purposes, the key benefits really of skilled worker is lower, lower thresholds generally in terms of skill and salary. Um, it leads to settlement, which is a big bonus. You can extend it and you can bring people with you. The main issue is the English language test, whereas on the flip side, intercompany transfer, no English language test, which is good news. But then it doesn't lead to settlement. There's more limited options to extend it. And then there's that requirement to work the overseas entity. Next slide, please, Andrew. So the third visa category I said that I would mention in my part of the presentation is the representative overseas business route. So this can be suitable if you're the sole representative of a business planning to set up a UK branch or wholly owned subsidiary. I'm not going to touch on the financial and English language requirements as typically they can be easily overcome. What I will focus on is the specific sole representative requirements because this essentially makes the visa category quite prohibited and difficult to set you know means that it's not going to be appropriate for, for a lot of people so the ones I draw on in particular is you need to hold a senior position within the business fine you need to have full authority to make decisions on its behalf generally fine but the problem is you cannot own or control the majority of it so you cannot have more than 50% of the voting rights or 50% of the shares and various other sort of requirements, which means that if it's your business or you have a controlling stake in it, this route is not going to be a viable option. The other thing as well is typically high net worth individuals may not wish to work or they may wish to work for multiple organisations or for themselves, you know, in senior executive roles. Under this route, you have to work full time for the business or subsidiary for the duration of your stay in the UK. Um, which again can be another reason why this route's not not necessarily going to be appropriate for for everyone. Uh, the next slide, please, Andrew. So similar to skill worker and intercompany transfer, I've just put the main pros and cons of the route on the slide. So you know, under this route, you can work full time for your employer, bring your family, um, apply to settle at a later date. But then the cons are, you know, it can be quite restrictive in terms of what you can and can't do and whether you're going to be eligible. There's the English language test, as always, to satisfy. Um, and it can be quite a document heavy process. So a lot of supporting documents do tend to need to be sent alongside the application, um, which means it can take quite a bit of time to pull together um, so that you're ready for, for your submission. And that probably covers the most, the three main business immigration routes. There are others. Um, so if you want to talk about those, please do get in touch. But otherwise, I'll hand you back to Myra, who will now talk a bit more about indefinite leave to remain. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Andrew.
So essentially, indefinitely to remain is the same as permanent residence and settled status in terms of the right to remain in the UK, albeit that there are slight differences. So provided that the applicant meets the relevant visa requirements during the residence in the UK, then they are eligible to apply for indefinite, indefinite leave to remain in the UK. Generally speaking, the residence requirement is five years, apart from some of the exceptions under the Tier 1 investor visa, which Susanna has already mentioned. Uh, it's worth remembering that res residence for immigration purposes is different to residence for tax purposes. So, for example, like a day is calculated differently under UK tax law and the immigration rules. So tax residents and immigration residents should always be reviewed side by side to make sure that the client can achieve their objectives. So the absence requirement for indefinitely to remain under most UK visa categories is no more than 180 days of absence from the UK in any 12 month period. This is calculated on a rolling basis. So in other words, the applicant must have been in the UK for a total of at least 185 days in any 12 month period for five years to the to meet the requirement. Um, it's worth flagging that um, indefinite leave to remain um, can be revoked or it can lapse. This is particularly important for those who are planning to become non-resident for tax purposes. So for someone who's obtained such a status um, under the EU settlement scheme, they can be absent from the UK for up to five consecutive years without losing the status. If the individual obtains settled status as a Swiss national, then they can be absent from the UK for up to four consecutive years without losing their settled status. But for everyone else who has indefinite leave to remain, they can spend up to two consecutive years away from the UK without losing their status. Moving on to citizenship and the next slide, please. There are actually six types of British nationality, um, including the British national overseas, which we mentioned earlier. The most common one is British citizenship. So whenever we receive an immigration inquiry, we always start the analysis with whether the individual is eligible for citizenship, which can be acquired by birth or by adoption or by registration or by naturalization. So that's available to those who have held indefinitely to remain for at least one year, unless they're married to a British citizen, in which case they don't have to wait that one year before applying. A common misconception is that when you apply for citizenship, you automatically get a British passport. Well, this is not true, I'm afraid. So once the individual obtains citizenship, then they have to make a separate application for British passport, um, albeit that the application is quite simple and straightforward, but it's something to bear in mind if you um, are under time pressure. Also, the UK allows for dual nationality, but not every country does. So it's worth bearing in mind when you're advising a client on uh, obtaining British citizenship. Due to the recent changes in the Home Office guidance and the point being raised by leading commentators, we've seen an increased number of inquiries surrounding citizenship and domicile. And we want to stress that the law on this hasn't changed, but the two concepts do interact. The starting point is that when you apply for citizenship by naturalisation, in and of itself will not automatically make the applicant UK domicile. However, it's one of the factors to be considered. And it really depends on the nature of the application and the statements that are being made in the application form. Therefore, it's very important to consider these issues carefully at the time of making the application. We have published an article on this um, on the interaction of citizenship by naturalisation on domicile, but it ought to be looked at on a case by case basis because it's very fact specific. Susanna will now discuss some of the key points to consider before moving to the UK. Thank you, Myra. Perfect. Andrew already got me onto the next slide. Thank you very much. So this is the final slide before we move on to questions. Um, so we've already discussed, I think, in quite a lot of detail, I guess, the importance of considering your immigration and tax position at the same time. And this slide is just a reminder of some of the other issues that clients considering moving to the UK should consider prior to their move. So, for example, are there any tax or reporting obligations in the country they're emigrating from? And we mentioned South Africa earlier, and that, that's one of the ones that we commonly see where people need to look at their position carefully. Are there exit taxes or exchange control issues? Are there any timing issues that should be taken into account? Whether that could be a period of dual residence when they may remain resident in the country they're immigrating from and the UK tax resident, or is it possible there could be a period of non-residence in any country? 
Clients also often want to purchase UK property either prior to the move or shortly after their arrival. And there are important tax issues to consider there, both in terms of minimising their longer term UK tax exposure, for example, their inheritance tax exposure, but also in terms of their immediate exposure to stamp duty land tax. And, and there's new things now around sort of non-residents and, and um, having to pay that a supplemental charge. So again, there, there are things there that need to be looked at carefully. Um, and in the longer term, what are the client's objectives from a tax immigration and succession planning perspective? And how do those in objectives interrelate? Whilst it doesn't always happen, in an ideal world, we would recommend considering all of these issues prior to the move to the UK and ideally as early as possible in the UK tax year prior to the intended year of the move itself. I think that concludes um, our slides for today. So we can move on to the questions. I appreciate we haven't left a lot of time for um, questions with, with everything we've covered, but hopefully we'll have time for one and one or two. Um, so I'm just trying to pull up the Q&A. My mind is not actually pulling them up very well, but I can see there is one question here. Um, I think probably Katie, you'd be best to take this one. It says, for how long can you stay in the UK um, and can you do any work if you're if you're a visitor? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, there's, uh, it's a bit confusing, but there are four types of visitor technically. So um, standard visitors, uh, if you're visiting under sort of marriage and civil partnership or a permitted paid engagement or just as a transit visitor on, on your way to another destination. But the standard visitor is the most common and generally it would allow an individual to come um, to the UK for up to six months in any 12 month period, provided it's for a temporary purpose. Um, and it meets the requirements of the route. So there are some exceptions which would allow you to stay a little bit longer. And there's also a possibility of holding a longer term multiple entry visit visa, which can allow multiple visits um, for up to six months at a time for um, two, five and even even 10 years. Although that's much more unusual and it can be more difficult to satisfy the immigration official why you're still entering as a, as a genuine visitor and why you can still satisfy the requirements of the route. So as a general rule, I'd say up to six months um, in, in a 12 month period, but um, it depends on exactly the purpose of your visit um, and, and things like that as well. Oh, and can you work? I suppose the second point is um, it's there are obviously what you can and can't do under the visitor visa is set out in the immigration rules. So you, it's really important that you cannot intend to work in the UK and you are explicitly prohibited from taking employment in the UK under the visitor visa route um, for obvious reasons. They don't, you know, the Home Office don't want people coming in as a as a visitor and then trying to stay. You can't switch from visitor to a permanent route, for example. Um, but there are certain permitted activities, so general business activities like attending meetings and things, that is permitted. But I'd encourage you to check the rules and maybe take advice if you are thinking of doing any kind of work in the UK um, under a visitor visa. That's perfect. Thank you, Katie. And there's just one other very quick one, maybe, Myra. Um, can you extend the Hong Kong BNO visa? Uh, yes, you can. So there are two um, types of visa you can apply for. You can apply for a two and a half year visa and then extend, or you can apply for five years and then you need indefinitely to remain uh, requirements and then you don't need to extend. But theoretically, you can keep extending um, until the route is no longer available, essentially. Thank you, Myra. Well, I'm sorry we've not had time to answer all of the questions, but I want to wrap it up um, when we promised at 45 um, minutes past the hour. So thank you very much to everybody for, for joining today. And um, we will respond to by email to any questions that we've not had time to cover over the next day or so. Um, thank you again for joining us. If you could spare a minute um, to complete the short feedback survey that will pop up when you exit the webinar, that would be greatly appreciated. And, and many thanks for joining us.